Chapter 2 of Our Little Spanish Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Remington. Our Little Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Roulet. Chapter 2 School Days. When Fernando was seven years old, he began to go to school. Little Juanita cried bitterly, for she was devoted to her big brother, who played such lovely games with her, and she did not like to think of his being away from her nearly all day. However, she was told that Fernando was a big boy now, and that before long she would be having a governess to teach her to read and embroider. So she stopped crying very quickly, for she was a sunny little child, and went to picking flowers in the garden quite contentedly. How grown up Fernando felt to be a real schoolboy! His school days were all alike. He arose at half past seven when the church bells were ringing for the daily service. He had a bath, said his prayers, and dressed himself very neatly, for he had first to be looked over by his ayah and then inspected by his mamma to see if he could pass muster, and was clean and neat as a little Spanish gentleman should be. Mama being satisfied with his appearance, he gave her his morning kiss and greeted the rest of the family. Then followed breakfast, a simple, wholesome meal of semola, or gruel and warm milk, with bread and honey and eggs. After a run in the garden, the ayo, or preceptor, called to take him to school. Fernando skipped happily away to study until twelve o'clock, when dinner was served to the day boarders. A dinner of soup, vegetables, and dessert, with a little playtime afterward. Spanish boys do not take tea or coffee until they are grown up. At half past four, the boys are turned out of school. And then comes the delight of the day to Fernando. His ayo has disappeared, and in his stead has come Manuel, his own man, who tells such delightful stories of knights and warriors and the glories of Spain and who thinks that all his little master does is perfect. Manuel knows all about the city, and he is willing to take Fernando any place he wishes to go, provided it is a fit place for a boy of rank. He knows just where the marionettes are playing, and if there is a gay crowd on the square, a trained bear, or a funny little monkey, he will be sure to have heard about it and take Fernando to see it. If there is no special excitement, Manuel takes him to the Paseo, where all the boys of the town gather. Here they play and mimic battles and bullfights, and Fernando enters into everything with delight, until Manuel thinks it's time for the Senora, his mother, to pass by in the carriage. How delighted this little boy is to see her, and how his tongue rattles as he tells her all the events of the day as he rides home with her through the long, soft twilight of this soft Spanish night. How good his supper tastes! A simple little supper of chocolate, rich and dark, white bread and golden honey, with some little iced cakes, which dear old Dolores, the cook, has made for the little master. All the servants love Fernando dearly. For though he has a hot temper and sometimes is very willful, he is so loving that they do not mind his naughtiness. After supper, Fernando says the rosary with his ayah, goes over his lessons a little, and then tumbles into bed in a happy slumber. All his days are very much alike, for Spanish children are brought up very simply and have little excitement, though they have many pleasures. There are little visits paid to aunts and cousins, visits remembered not too pleasantly by the pet, dog, and parrot of his aunt. The parrot was brought from Cuba by Uncle Enrico, the priest. The bird knows Fernando well, and scolds terribly in the most unchurchly language every time he approaches the cage. The French poodle, too, does not greatly care for a visit from Fernando, for the boy cannot help teasing, and the fat, stupid dog, his Aunt Isabel's darling, does nothing but lie around on silk cushions and eat comfits. Fernando likes animals and would never really hurt one, but there is something in the calm self-satisfaction of Pepino, 
that stirs up all the mischief in him, and Aunt Isabel has been heard to exclaim, Fernando will be my death. He is a dear boy, and if it came to choosing between him and Beppo, I am quite sure I would take my nephew. But thank heaven I have not to choose. Fernando's own dog was different. He found him one day close by the garden railing, a poor ragged fellow, lean and hungry with a lame foot, but a pair of pleading and wistful brown eyes which, with all their misery, had yet a look of good fellowship within them, which appealed to Fernando's gay nature, as the pitiful plight of the little fellow appealed to his tender heart. The dog put a pink tongue through the railing and licked Fernando's hand, and that clinched the bargain. Henceforth the two were friends. Fernando persuaded Manuel to bathe and tie up the wounded foot and feed the puppy. That was all the boy dared at first, but the next day he found the dog in the same place and fed him again. Every day after, the little tramp followed him to school, and when school was over, his yellow-haired dogship awaited his benefactor. Manuel winked at the friendship and allowed Mazo, as Fernando called him, to have many a good meal at the garden gate. Manuel was a great stickler for the properties, but he had been a boy once, and there were some things that Fernando's lady mother would not at all have comprehended, that good old Manuel understood perfectly. Mazo was far more interesting to Fernando than the thoroughbred, ladylike pets of his mother. And it was a sore subject with him that Mazo, who was so clever, who could whip the tramp dogs of any of his school friends, should be kept outside the house. His mother did not seem to realize that Mazo's fighting qualities were what made him valuable. One fatal day when she had driven to the paseo a little earlier than usual and had seen a fight between Mazo and another little dog, equally disreputable, she had cried out, Fernando, come away from that ferocious beast! He must be mad! And she had seemed anything but reassured when Fernando had tried to calm her down by saying, But Mama, he is not so mad. I know him well. He is the gentlest of beings. He can whip any dog in the paseo. The pride of possession getting the better of prudence. Thereafter, Manuel was most careful of Mazo's appearance. He captured him and washed him and let him sleep in a shed at night. And by degrees, the little fellow lost his trampish appearance and became a semi-respectable member of society. Though still ready to follow Fernando like a shadow, to fight at his will and to share with him an excursion into forbidden lands. It was really droll to see the different airs which Mazo could assume. He had ever an eye upon his audience, having early learned in the hard school of misfortune that his comfort depended not at all upon himself, but upon the humor of those about him. With the outside world his look was wary. With the family of his master he was apologetic. His brown eye seemed to say, I place myself at your feet, most noble seniors. I pray you excuse me for living. But with Fernando, while it was tempered with respect, his air was one of good fellowship alone. Even the senora herself, the head of the house and authority in chief, as is the case in all Spanish households, came to regard Fernando's dog with a degree of friendliness, and finding this out, the servants treated him kindly, and Mazo decided that his lines had fallen into pleasant places. Upon this, however, he never presumed. He knew not how long it would last, but felt that he was upon good behavior. He restrained his desire to chase Juanita's pet cat and to bark when the parrot imitated his barking. Though the restraint put upon himself must have been severe, for he made up for it when out with Manuel and Fernando, then he was himself again, Mazo the Tramp. End of chapter 2 Recording by Michelle Remington